Hey there. Um, I started to do a video here and then my phone went into this like weird emergency mode. Uh, anyway, let me try this again. I want to talk about Hebrews 3. Um, I don't have the verses in front of me because I need to watch the road. Um, anyway, we were talking about how Christ is the apostle, the high priest of our profession. And this is how he builds the house. As the son faithful over his house, uh, whose house we are, if we continue in the faith, uh, confident, you know, we don't want to be moved away from our assurance, and we want to build, be built up in confidence with joy. We are the habitation of God in spirit. Uh, we're the temple of God and a permanent building, the city whose builder and maker is God. And yet, in this age, there's something called edification. Through the New Testament ministry, which builds us up. And when we were in Ephesians 4, we talked about how uh, Christ in his resurrection gave gifts to the body, apostle, prophet, shepherd, evangelist, teacher, for the edification of the saints, or for the perfection of the saints, the equipping of the saints, unto the work of the ministry, unto the building, edification of the body in love. And the building is the house of God. And the habitation of God in spirit realized today in fellowship and you could be deflated which means you're just miserable and in your flesh and thinking only about the things of the flesh and not at all encouraged about who you are in Christ and what you have those things seem so far away from you and so meaningless that means you're not being built up uh, that doesn't mean Christ is not faithful it means that there is a part of our pursuit of the truth that results in our enjoyment of that truth and we go through seasons in our life where we are still in the hand of the Lord and he's actually using it all to break our natural confidence in ourselves so that he'll more easily be able to edify us the people who are most easily edified and who can experience the blessing of ministry and be touched by the word are people who are soft and have no confidence in themselves and easily turn to the Lord because they know how weak they are. They're already checked into the hospital, they've received their diagnosis and they know they're there to stay. And so they more easily turn to the Lord, which means the truth is more accessible to them. Okay, he has to bring us through a process. Uh, to prepare us for that kind of being able to edify us and so as the high priest he has all authority in heaven and earth uh, as a king and, he, and a priest and he prays for us and intercedes for us and according to Romans 8 um, the spirit in us the first fruits of the spirit causes a kind of groaning as we sense the futility of this age and long to be clothed uh, with immortality that actually comes out of his intercession for us that causes us to groan within and the spirit likewise helps us in our weakness making intercession according to the will of God groaning with groanings that we can't utter he steps in and makes makes the intercession um, and that's why we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose because we have the intercession of the spirit and we and this intercession is our high priest who has all authority in heaven and earth he's head over all things to the church all of this is different than any other age okay this is all benefits of being a son of god and having been predestinated this is what predestination is about when you talk about predestined in the Bible, it's always talking about things related to sonship and inheritance, and it only belongs to the church. The people who were who were regenerated after the resurrection of Christ have received the first fruits of the Spirit, are born of God, and have the intercession of the high priest. Christ was not the high priest prior to his resurrection. He entered into his high priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek where he's not only just a priest making intercession for the people but he's the king with all authority in heaven and earth it's a whole higher level
And this is the apostle and the high priest of our profession who is the son faithful over his house, whose house we are, if we continue in the faith and we're and we said, look, that's not saying you can lose your salvation and walk away from the faith. What it's talking about is, are you deflated or are you being built up? And this is dependent on his work as the son faithful over his house. And some, so the, the question is, well, if I'm miserable, then I'm not being built up. Is he still faithful over his house? Well, if you're miserable you still have a high priest who's the son faithful over his house and part of his work is to work all things together for your good to bring you into the knowledge of him which eventually conforms you to his image and that's how we'll be glorified and everything um and that involves according to paul and second corinthians the tearing down of the natural man uh you know he said we are being renewed inwardly but our outer man is being consumed day by day both are true and one of the reasons we're miserable is because we have expectations built on the flesh and its natural wisdom about how things should be going and we're fighting against accepting the diagnosis that I can't do anything and entering rest, which means God has to do everything. I'm going to cease from my striving. Misery comes from striving because at some level you think you either can do it or should be able to. There's a lot of people who are miserable and say, I can't do anything. I just, everything is just, it always turns into failure. Well, okay, they're still disappointed about it. They haven't been brought into the real rest where the admission of I can do nothing means Christ is doing everything and I actually realize it and it brings me into joy. What he wants is for you to, you know, and, and the reason they haven't brought, been brought into that place is because they still expect that the flesh is supposed to do something and they're upset that it isn't. The fact that you're upset that it isn't doing what you think it should do means you've got still unrealistic expectations, or not unrealistic, you've got expectations on the flesh. Why would I be disappointed if I've already said I'm crucified with Christ? Of course, it's not going to work. Okay? So, a lot of people are being handled by the Lord through disillusionment, and that's part of his faithfulness. And his whole goal is to bring you to a place where you can be touched by him. Okay? And then edification works. Edification is no good for someone who can't receive the word because their eyes are entirely on themselves, even if they're a believer. That's called the carnal mind, and it's hostile to God and cannot be subject to him. Uh, a carnal mind is set on the self, has expectations on the flesh, is enmity with God because it's angry at what it perceives to be unfair treatment from God and an unfair hand dealt to it, uh, un unfair that I can't, you know, the good I would do, I can't do and the things that I hate those things I do and yet the law rings out every day saying you must obey and I can't and it's so unfair and I'm actually angry at God about it even though I'm saved that's carnal whereas spiritual means I can't do anything but this doesn't bring me into despair it leads me like Abraham to reckon my own body is dead in the barrenness of Sarah's womb and uh, give glory to God who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead and I'm waiting for the hope of righteousness I'm waiting for God to visit me in the day of life in the time of life and bring forth my Isaac which is Christ in me Christ manifested Christ is my life and you know you get to a point where you're no longer thinking so much I want Christ to be manifested in my life so that everybody can see how spiritual I am and then everybody gets saved and then I'll bear fruit and then I'll have rewards and I won't get punished for my lazy life. <laughs> no, you want Christ to be manifested to you in this moment so that you can taste the joy of your salvation and not be defeated by your circumstances. And this is called the salvation of your soul. You know, Peter was written to people who couldn't do anything. They were checkmated by a situation where they were the Jewish believers and they were among Gentiles who were suspicious of them and slandered them for being evildoers. This was around the time when Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. 
uh, the judgment was coming on the Jews. They were strangers and pilgrims having been cast out from their own people, the Jewish people, for following Christ. And they're scattered among the Gentiles who all persecute them and hate them for being Jewish. So their natural families hate them and reject them for being Christian. The Roman world hates them for being Jewish. Uh, and the Christians are afraid of them too because of all the Judaizers that went around and tore up the churches and the wolves. And so if you were a Jew at that time, I don't think things were easy at all. And you couldn't do anything. And all of Peter's advice in those epistles, and I call them a survival guide for untenable situations, we think of it as those are instructions for how to be holy. You know, submit to your husband like Abraham, Sarah to Abraham and called him Lord because you don't know if you're going to win him. And, uh, you know, don't when you work for your boss, just suffer. Don't answer. Uh, be like Jesus, prepared with an armed a mind to suffer. And they're slandering you as evildoer, but you don't answer. You're like a sheep led to the slaughter. Uh, that And we think, well, that's how I'm supposed to be. You know, no. Peter was writing not to Corinth that had all these options. Like today, we have options. A woman, if she's in an abusive home, can move out of the home, separate, get into an apartment, uh, get a part-time job, and then get some counseling. You know, with the with, we have options because we're rich. But the Jewish people at that time didn't have those kind of options. They were stuck in whatever situation they were in. And because of that, if they were in an abusive situation, there was nothing they could do. In fact, anything they tried to do, anything they said, anything they answered for themselves would only lead to more abuse, more persecution. And Peter called this the fiery trial. But he said, you know, um, that the... the he, there's an inheritance incorruptible reserved for you in the last time and you're being guarded by faith uh, through the power of God unto the salvation ready to be revealed at the last time even though in the present time if necessary you are under manifold temptations because of the fiery trial but this is for the showing forth or the demonstration or the testing and the proving of your faith which is more precious than gold which perishes, even though it's tried by fire, which will be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, and whom though not seeing him yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, which things angels desire to look into. The salvation of your soul is that you're in a situation where you are checkmated and you know you can't do anything. And is this from God? It sure doesn't seem like it. It seems like it's all from the devil. The devil's attacking me. But these people are learning that the only thing I can do is lean on Jesus Christ. And what I'm hoping in is not a spectacular witness. I'm hoping to survive the day. So that my husband doesn't rail at me and abuse me. And I don't get in the flesh and talk back and get smacked and I my boss who's accusing me of evil uh, has nothing to say he's not buffeting me or if he is buffeting me for my fault there's no glory in that you know but I've got a good conscience before God and I know that this I, I still have joy and peace this is the salvation this is Christ being magnified in my body this is what we hope and expect not so much that the situation would be this or that. Sometimes that's not an option. We stop setting our hopes on our expectation of a situation uh, that's going to work itself out. We set our hope on Christ, who is our Isaac. And we're reckoning our body is dead in the barrenness of Sarah's womb, giving glory to God, waxing strong in faith, counting that he's faithful, who promised, and he'll also do it, and he gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are and that means even though my situation is terrible he calls Christ into my situation and is manifest to me as my joy and peace that's edification that is the salvation of your soul when you're rejoicing with joy unspeakable now it doesn't always take that you have to be in a fiery trial Peter said now if necessary you are going through these temptations and the fiery trial of your faith. 
But that's not to test if you have faith. That's to show forth the quality because the angels are looking. The angels are watching this going, what are these people who don't see God and yet in all this weakness and trial, they're rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory and actually enjoy, enjoying the salvation they've been given. That's what the proving of your faith is for. It's for the angels and it's to put Christ on display. It's for his testimony. But to you, you're not thinking about the testimony at that time. You're just thinking, how do I survive the day? And yet it actually does produce a testimony. And the people who could be edified are people who that have that kind of soft heart where they've given up on putting hope in their circumstances and hope in this world and hope in their flesh and always trying to make something happen. And here's the thing, we, we never get to a point where we're completely 100% like that. Every day, I can pick things up in my flesh and start moving and go and set my hope on things and doing things, okay? Well then, when I'm like that, it's really hard for me to be edified. I'm too distracted, too disappointed, too disillusioned, too frustrated, too full of my own zeal and expectations and hopes. Well, through enough life failure though, I have gotten to a point where it's easier for me to give up and go, well, give up your failure then and Jesus is going to beat you at the meeting post, you know, he's going to whip you, take you outside, you know, sluggard, uh, consider the ants, they, they labor all day, sluggard, no, um, unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor do so in vain and I need the Lord to build this house, I ain't building anything, um, but every day I try, I try to start building something. And while I'm building, he's praying, you know, uh, but eventually I go through enough things to go, I need the Lord, you know, and then in those times, that's when he can really build me up and edify me. Well, Hebrews is talking about how Christ is the son faithful over his house. And he's the apostle and the high priest of our profession and it's the profession that produces the confidence and the joy of the Christian life and the Jewish believers at that time were going through the same thing like in Peter where they're persecuted by everybody misunderstood by everybody and they're tempted to go back to the law tempted to go back to temple just to get the guilties off their back get the guilties off their conscience and yet throughout Hebrews he's telling them look if you go back there it doesn't perfect the conscience you're going to be even worse you want you think that because you're not in the temple, you're somehow disobedient to Moses. What do you think your conscience is going to do when you trod underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of Jesus uh, by which you were sanctified an unclean thing and despite the spirit of grace? Now, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, but you were afraid to be associated with the people of God because you thought you might be being disobedient to God because you're disregarding Moses. Well, now you're going to disregard the Son of God and think you're going to have a better conscience and a better experience of Christ? No. You need to come outside the camp and enjoy Christ. And you need to be careful and not get bitter and harden your heart. Because if you harden your heart, God can't really edify you. and You're going to be miserable. And you could live your whole Christian life that way. And that's called falling in the wilderness. There's so many people that are just miserable and can't be touched. And yes, Christ is the high priest and he's going to bring them to an end of themselves. And when they finally go see him in glory, they'll find out I couldn't do anything. And then they'll be edified. But so we are being built up to be the temple of God. But like it said in Ephesians 2, you're growing into a temple in the, in the spirit. But you also are being built up to become a habitation of God in spirit. And that has to do with ministry, which edifies. And that is our food and drink based on the profession of Christ. How relevant is it to me today that I eat and drink of him to survive and to have joy? If that doesn't compute to you and you go, I don't really care about that at all. I just want to make sure I'm not going to lake a fire. Just solve my problem so I can get back to my life. I'm tired of being afraid of being in a lake of fire. You are on the milk and you're drifting from the things this great salvation which we heard you're neglecting it you know uh because of your hardness of heart and it's unbelief and it's sin and it's evil so what he's going to say in the next parts of the chapter are the really kind of the second warning the first was let's not we need to take heed to the things we heard in chapter two concerning this great salvation lest we let them slip and drift from them now he's going to say 
okay, you've got a Christ who is the son faithful over his house. He's the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He is the apostle and high priest of your profession, and you are a partaker of the heavenly calling. And you should be confident and joyful if you continue in the faith. Therefore, he starts to say, don't harden your heart as they did in the wilderness. And this is where people start to go, uh-oh. Another one where he's saying, I can lose my salvation because we could fall in the wilderness. And God was grieved with that generation because they didn't understand his ways. They didn't obey the law. No, that's not the point. They saw his works but didn't understand his heart. They only saw the law and Sinai and the cloud, but they didn't know God at all. And that's how we can be when we're carnal in our mind and frustrated that things aren't working out and angry at God. And what the wilderness people said was, did you just bring us out here to die? And when they said that, eventually it got to a point where God in his wrath said he was grieved with that generation. They're all going to die in the wilderness. That's it. I'm done. Now, he doesn't do that with us, but it's still possible because he's not going to override your will that you would stay miserable your whole life. Even though he's providing for you, you can't even see it because you're so blind and can't be edified, can't be touched, can't receive the word. You're just, it's all irrelevant to you. Why isn't my situation working out? Why am I always such a failure? Well, you have too many hopes in yourself and you are totally looking at yourself and you think success means X, Y, Z, but you don't understand spiritual things. You cannot be encouraged by the building work of God uh, you can't be edified. You're not confident. You're not rejoicing. And it's really a bad witness. Uh, there's no testimony there. You're wandering around in the wilderness and you're hardening your heart against the speaking of God. So the next part of the chapter, which we'll get into, I got to get going, but um, the next part of the chapter is about all the starting the warnings about Look, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the wilderness. And he said, I was grieved with that generation. Now, this is the first time, uh, the, the second time, really, it's, the, it's about the same time Ephesians was written, I believe. So these are the two times, Ephesians 4 and this, are the word grieve God. And we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And again, everybody says, well, if I sin, I grieved him. He's all sad because I sinned. no. If you believe that, it's because you still have confidence in the flesh. He's not grieved that we sin. He has like, We have a high priest for that who, who offered himself for our sins. And it says, boldly come forward to the throne of grace through faith in the blood. What he's grieved at is you won't come forward. You will not fellowship with God. You won't be renewed. You won't be, uh, you walk in the, as it says in Ephesians 4, you do not be like the Gentiles walking in the futility of their mind. Uh, having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God which is, uh, and, and being turned over just over to your feelings which is what lasciviousness is you just live by your feelings but you didn't learn Christ that way if so be it that you've heard of him and learned of him as the truth is in Jesus uh, and it says do not grieve the spirit of God in that context what does it mean to grieve the spirit of God well actually it's interesting because in Ephesians 4, it starts out, walk in a manner worthy of your calling, keeping the unity of the faith. And then there's the apostol the unity uh, is supplied and the faith is supplied by the ministry, which corresponds to Christ being a son faithful over his house, who gives the evangelist, shepherd, apostle, prophet, teacher for the perfecting of the saints under the work of the ministry, for the building up the edification of the house whose house we are according to hebrews it's it corresponds because in chapter four of ephesians paul is talking about the building up of the house of god the habitation of god in spirit through the ministry by being edified and he talks about walking worthily of your calling and then he says don't grieve the spirit and then here in hebrews 3 he starts with uh Therefore, brethren, partakers of the holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of your profession who was faithful uh, to him who appointed him as Moses was faithful over his house and Christ as a son is faithful over his house, whose house we are. If we continue in the faith and we talked about that's edification, we're being built up. Then he says, don't be like those in the wilderness with whom God was grieved. So literally, 
The two times that the word grieved is used in the New Testament is not related to sin in general. It's related to not being able to receive the ministry of Jesus Christ in his edification work as the son faithful over his house. And it is not working worthy of your calling, as it says in Ephesians 4. And it is uh, not seeing that you are a partaker of the heavenly calling in Ephesians, I mean, sorry, Hebrews 3. Wow, that's the first time I've seen that. I never saw that. I knew that that was the two times that it was used. But literally, the context is exactly the same. The map of the chapter is exactly the same. That's crazy. Go check it out. Read Ephesians. That's your homework. Read Ephesians 4, 1 through 20. And then go read Hebrews 3, 1 through the end of the chapter, and I'll bet you a dollar that you, um, and I don't even have PayPal, so I'm not giving you a dollar. Well, I do have PayPal, but I'm not giving you a dollar. But anyway, I bet you a dollar that they're exactly the same. Grieving the Spirit is in the context of not working, walking worthy of your calling because you can't receive the ministry because you're walking the futility of your mind and you, uh, are hardening yourself against God and not receiving his present speaking. You're not being edified. You're not enjoying your salvation. That's what it means to walk in the futility of your mind. And, to, and this is what grieves God. We don't know his heart. We think he's a hard taskmaster. We still have expectations on ourselves. So we can't yield to him. We won't listen to his word. And what Paul is all building up to say is you won't get into the meat of the word. You're still in the milk. Am I going into the lake of fire or not? Leave me alone. <laughs> so anyway, I got to get going. Um, something to ponder. Uh, talk to you later.